so I couldn't go to school anymore. Uh, my father worked for a, a Jewish company of shoemakers, and this was put out of business. This was closed down very quickly, so my father was out of work. The Nazis' objective was actually to rid Eisenstadt, Burgenland, the whole province of Burgenland, to rid them of, entirely of Jews. This was really ethnic cleansing, if you like. So we, along with the entire Jewish community of uh, Eisenstadt, we were compelled to leave everything behind in September 1938, leave our home, leave our belongings, and move out. And what we did, what my parents did, they found a small flat in, in this building here in, in Vienna, in what is today, what was then also, the, uh, uh, the so-called Jewish quarter of Vienna. Um, we lived on the second floor in a small flat there, and uh, uh, during this time, my father was making desperate efforts to obtain an exit visa, uh, either for England or the United States or for Palestine. Whichever came first, this is what my father was prepared to take. Uh, he, were, he was imprisoned for a few weeks. Luckily, he was released. Uh, anyway, suddenly, on the 9th of November, 1938, came Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. <coughs> An orchestrated attack by Nazis on Jewish property in Germany and Austria. Synagogues and other Jewish buildings and shops were attacked, ransacked, pillaged and burned. We lived in this street uh, and there was actually a synagogue in the street that we lived in. And on that night, on the 9th of November, when I looked out of my bedroom window from the second floor, down in the middle of the street below our, our, our building, there was a bonfire of Torah scrolls and prayer books which had been set by the Nazis and which was burning there in the middle of the street. Now, the reason, the reason, the reason for this uh, attack, the, the pretext, and it was really only a pretext for the attack on Kristallnacht, was in fact the assassination of a German diplomat in Paris, a man called Ernst von Rath. And he was assassinated by a young Polish Jew called Herschel Greenspan, whose parents had been really badly treated by the Nazis uh, in Germany. And he wanted some sort of revenge. And his idea of revenge was to assassinate a German diplomat. And uh, the, German used, the, the Nazis used that as a pretext. We know that it was a pretext because, in fact, we know that the police and the fire brigades in Austria and in Germany <coughs> had all been given instructions to uh, not to interfere with, with, what, with what was going to happen uh, on the day, on the two days, the 9th and the 10th of, uh, of November. So. What happened in fact then, you can see that, that's one of the synagogues, but this one not, is not in, in, in Vienna, this one is actually in Berlin. I'll come back to Mr. Neville Chamberlain in a moment. This is more or less the result of Kristallnacht in figures. Seven and a half thousand businesses were destroyed. All those synagogues burned, of which 177 totally destroyed, and worst of all, 91 Jews have been murdered during that period of Kristallnacht. But they say that every cloud has a silver lining, and the events of Kristallnacht acted as a catalyst in certain quarters of this country, of the United Kingdom. And the concept of the kinder transport, in fact, was formed. 
So let me try and explain what happened. Uh, the word kinder transport is, the, is also, the, the other word is also the refugee children's movement, is the name given to the rescue mission that took place nine months prior to the outbreak of World War II. It started in November 1938, immediately after Kristallnacht, and finished in August, at the end of August 1939, just before the outbreak of the of Second World War. And what happened during that period, uh, about 10,000 children, predominantly Jewish children, were rescued from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland through this kinder transport movement. Uh, on the 15th of November 1938, just after Kristallnacht, a delegation of leading British Jews went to see Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister at that time, and they appealed to him, asking him to allow Jewish children between the ages of 3 and 17 to be allowed to come to the United Kingdom for a temporary period that they would go back or return or leave the country again after the crisis. Chamberlain turned down this delegation. He refused the request. He said, Hitler is someone with whom I can do a deal. Luckily, a few days later, a group of influential Quakers <coughs> went to see Sir Samuel Hoare, who at that time was the Home Secretary, and who himself came from a Quaker family. And he, together with another Quaker, Philip Noel Baker, they then went to see the Prime Minister and tried again. And this time, they succeeded in persuading Chamberlain to change his mind. The Cabinet debated the issue a day or two later, and it was also then debated in the House of Commons. And finally, the government agreed to allow the immigration of uh, children between 3 and 17, and no limit was placed on the numbers at that time. Now, the Quakers were terribly important in all this. The Quakers influenced the Prime Minister. They made the plan work. They were at stations in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. They were at the Hook of Holland, the port from which uh, the ship sailed towards Harwich made sure that children got onto the ship safely. And they were at Liverpool Street Station in London, making sure that there was somebody there to meet the children when they arrived. And equally important, they paid money, because at that time the government were asking for a guarantee of 50 pounds per child. And 50 pounds in 1938-39 is like 3,000 pounds in today's money an enormous amount of money really, and the Quakers paid that quietly for something like 7,000 children. Very, very important feature. Now the rescue operation, in general, was a success. Uh, most of these children survived the war. A small percentage, and only a very small percentage, was ever reunited with parents. The vast majority lost their parents in the Holocaust, murdered by the Nazis. They lost their homes and their families forever, the majority. Their parents had been murdered along with six million European Jews, including nearly one and a half million children. And questions have obviously been asked whether more could not have been done by various countries to allow Jews to enter their countries before the war, before all this happened. Countries such as the United States, Canada, Australia, South American countries, they were simply closed to, uh, to continental Jews who, are, who were unable to support themselves financially. And even the United Kingdom placed very severe restrictions on immigrants. But at least 
The government in power in 1938 has the blessing, has the thanks of some 10,000 children whose lives were saved. <coughs> Many people came forward as foster parents to take in children. And uh, you may have heard the family of Richard and David Attenborough. Uh, they took in two girls, and these two girls were brought up as siblings with Richard and David in that home. I remember the photos here, which you might like to see. This is a typical photo of young children on the train. I had one of those numbers around my neck. But I don't remember what my number was. Uh, a typical sort of uh, identity card which had to be issued. And that's my identity card uh, to enable me to enter the, the United Kingdom at Harwich. And there it says, gives my name, my date of birth, where I was born, and where I actually lived, which was the, the, the street in Vienna that I showed you. Interestingly enough, but incidentally, on the top it says, this document of identity is issued with the approval of His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom to young persons to be admitted to the United Kingdom for educational purposes under the care of the Inter-Aid Committee for Children. So, that's that. But on the, on the back of that card, there's a stamp with a date. The date is shown as the 13th of January. Now, I know that I left on, at midnight on the 11th of January. So that journey must have taken something like 36 hours. Um, you know, going through Austria, through Germany, getting to the Netherlands, and through the Netherlands to the Hook of Holland, overnight by uh, ship, uh, by ferry boat from the Hook of Holland to Harwich, and then from Harwich to Liverpool Street Station uh, by train. In Liverpool Street Station, have any of you seen this statue in Liverpool Street Station? Nobody. You have, right. Well, if you get an opportunity next time you're in London and you happen to be anywhere near Liverpool Street Station, look out for this statue. It's a very lovely statue showing a group of children with suitcases and uh, the names of the cities from which they came. Places like Berlin, Leipzig, Dresden, Vienna, and so on. And it was a statue made by uh, an Israeli uh, sculptor called uh, Fritz Meisler. Meisler himself came from, on the Kinder Transport, he came to England from Danzig in Poland, and uh, uh, there are in fact now four statues similar to this in four different places. Uh, in addition to Liverpool Street, there's one uh, in Berlin, there's another one in Danzig itself, which is where he came from. And the fourth one is, in fact, at the Hook of Holland. And this is a, a newspaper cutting going back uh, um, to, to uh, uh, the 70 year commemoration of the Kinder Transport. My wife and I went there for the unveiling of this statue and for this comm commemoration party, if you like. Um, and uh, Fritz Meister himself with his daughter, they came there to unveil that statue. And at the top there, in Dutch, it, is, it says, forever thankful, the statue for the Kinder Transport unveiled. This is another one. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, my family, but let me come back to that later. So, My, my, <clears throat> my younger brother, who was two and a half years younger than me, he stayed behind with my parents. Now, my parents, luckily, were able to obtain a visa to come to the United Kingdom, and they came about two months after my arrival. 
uh, the condition for them to allow, be allowed to come, they had to work as domestic servants. And uh, they worked uh, for two doctors uh, in a small place near Leeds, a place called Eden. Whereas, as far as I was concerned, <clears throat> I came to a family, a Jewish family in Leeds and uh, settled down with this Jewish family uh, who were extremely kind and welcoming. And I went to the local elementary school in Leeds uh, Cowper Street School, wearing typical Austrian school wear, plus fours. Um, it was winter, and that's the sort of thing that an Austrian schoolboy would wear in winter. Um, obviously, that made me the centre of attention, and also the fact that obviously I couldn't speak a word of English at that time. Um, luckily, one of the teachers in the school was Jewish, and he spoke some Yiddish. Yiddish has some <coughs> semblance to German, so we managed to make ourselves understood. And as far as I was concerned, within a matter of weeks, I was speaking reasonable English good enough to uh, communicate with my peers. How many of you are not born in this country? There's quite a number. Wow. And how old were you when you arrived? Five. So you, you must have experienced also the fact that you had a problem, you, had, you spoke no English when you came, presumably, and you came here, and you then uh, had to settle down with friends speaking a foreign language. And I guarantee that, like me, you learned to speak English within weeks at school with all your friends. Am I right? Yes. So, and nowadays, you are all typical English schoolboys and schoolgirls. Exactly the same as happened to me in those days. So, at the outbreak of war in uh, September 1939, I was evacuated to Lincolnshire to live with a farming family there who obviously didn't speak a word of German. And uh, so my, my English improved very rapidly, but my German also deteriorated, because if you're not using a language, you lose it. And uh, this happened to me. Now, this, this became quite dramatic, because after, my, I, after I'd been there about four months, my parents came to visit. And although my father had managed to get some English uh, and spoke with some uh, effect. My mother was very poor at languages altogether. And so what happened, <coughs> what happened was that um, she spoke to me in German, which I understood perfectly well, but I replied in English, which was now becoming my first language. And she did not understand what I was saying. And after a few minutes, she burst into tears and was really, really upset and more or less insisted that I should come back to Leeds, back to civilization, as she called it, as quickly as possible, which is indeed what happened. But, and so, after I'd been in Lincolnshire for about six months, uh, I came back to Leeds, and this time I lived in a, in a hostel for immigrant children, together with my younger brother, and we were in fact the two youngest in that hostel. Now, around this time, uh, by uh, middle, early middle 1940, Austrian and German Jews, adults, were being interned. Have any of you heard about the internment of so-called enemy aliens? No, no, it is, this, is, this was a very serious feature in that German Jews and Austrian Jews had much more reason to uh, hate the Nazis than the average Englishman. But the government was worried that there might be some sort of spy elements among them, that some might be not 
sympathetic to uh, the English cause. And so Churchill at that time said, collar the lot, put the lot behind bars. Well, it wasn't quite bars, but so what happened was that all these enemy aliens, and my father at that time, because he was Austrian by nationality, he was considered to be an enemy alien. All these people were then interned, another word for imprisoned, if you like, a rather gentler form of imprisonment. They were interned either to the Isle of Man, or they were sent to Canada, or to Australia. I mean, there is the dreadful story of the ship, the Dunera, uh, which took a shipload of uh, uh, Austrian and German Jews to uh, Australia, and these people were extremely badly treated. This is a well-known thing. If you're interested in that, look under Dunera on the internet and you'll find the story there. Anyway, my father was interned. He spent a year, more or less, on the Isle of Man. But after a year, came back to Leeds, they were released. Uh, the government suddenly realized that they'd made a mistake and uh, allowed these people back. Many of them went into the army. My father went, came back to Leeds and started to work in war work, munitions production in Leeds. Um, my, mo my mother continued to work in domestic service and of course my brother and I were still living in this uh, hostel for children. But by about uh, late 41, early 42, uh, my parents managed to scrape together enough money so that they either rented or bought, I'm not quite sure what it was, a small house and we lived together there for the first time in a couple of years. We lived together as a family then. And the time came for me to take the 11 plus examination to get me to a grammar school for grammar school education. And the problem was that I then failed that exam. So the choice, if I wanted to have a grammar school education, the choice was my parents could pay. Now the, the, the grammar school in North Leeds where we lived, Round Hay School, they wanted 15 pounds a term which was a lot of money for my father in those days. The Coburn High School in Leeds, in South Leeds, however, they only wanted five pounds a term. So that's where I went. And so every day I had to cross the center of Leeds from north to south and back again. Um, and this went on either by tram or by bicycle, depending on my age. And uh, so that's how it went. Luckily, by the time, by a couple of years later, I had a second opportunity for uh, an examination to, to obtain free education, and this time I passed. So the remainder of my education in Leeds Coburn High School was free. Now this, by the way, is a uh, family, my, my, my family, and my mother and father with my younger brother, uh, taken when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. I don't really know exactly when. And the next one is of interest to you. That's the Coburn High School first 11 football team. Now there are no prizes, but who can uh, find me on there? Volunteers. Yes? I'll give you, yes? Sorry? I am on there, yes. Which one? So what? No, you have to say, not point, just say which it is. Describe it. The one with the ball? Definitely not, no, no. <laughs> that one with the ball, incidentally, subsequently became a member of parliament. His name was Geoffrey Rhodes. Yes. Yes. No? No? Any of the ladies, yes. The one at the top of the middle, like at the top. Mm. The, the middle, middle at the top, yeah. no, no. I give you a clue. You have to find the most handsome one then. <laughs> yes. I the one next to the pool on the right, left hand side. 
Nick, sitting down. No, 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 definitely not. No. Yes. I can't hear you. No, no, no. Yes. Well, you're nearly there. It's second from the left on the top, at the back. Okay. Easy. Now that I've told you, you will recognize me. Right. So, our education, my brother and I, am I running out of time? We've reached half past, so... What time are we required to finish? About, now for some people, if they need to leave, but if oh. everyone, is everyone okay to stay until quarter past? Quarter two, sorry? Yes, for another 15 minutes? Well, I mean, if if, uh, if I can I can stop here if you like, and we can uh, deal with some questions. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's nothing.